Americans rebel, they are erased from history. Hello, and thanks for joining us for Encore's weekly film show with our film critic, Lisa Nesselson. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Eve. And we're starting with the new Shaun the Sheep movie, Farmageddon. Should we flock to see it? <laughs> well, of course. It's wild and woolly. <laughs> and thanks to a few musical numbers, it's got a good bleat and you can dance to it. <laughs> uh, the animators, of course, are on the other side of the English Channel, but I would like to point out that there's a great deal of French production money in this delightful wordless romp that's genuinely suitable for all ages. I saw it with a batch of hard-nosed professional film critics, and there was audible laughter from start to finish, much of it generated by me. Um, <laughs> Four years ago, in the clever and hilarious Shaun the Sheep movie, the animals of Mossy Bottom Farm ended up in the big city, the animated clay version of London. Now, here the action is set very close to home when a flying saucer lands beside the farm. The critter it contains not only comes in peace, it comes in benign blobbiness because colorful, floppy-eared Lula is a baby alien. And uh, the flashback to how she ended up careening across the space to Earth is very funny. Now, Shaun wants to help her get back to her planet. Government agents want to capture and study her. Uh, the dog, who is eternally at odds with the sheep, has motives of his own. And the farmer thinks he can cash in on the whole alien craze by making a theme park called, what else? Farmageddon. OK, well, let's take a look at the animated antics. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, it's just incredible how the Aardman animators bring clay and wire to life, isn't it? It is, because uh, they make it look easy. If you and I were to buy some clay and stare at it, it would have minimal entertainment value, I think. Um, be it known that I think it's insulting to say that when people behave uh, unthinkingly, they're behaving like sheep. Because the sheep in Aardman movies, led by intrepid Sean, they may stick together, but they're proactive sheep. They get things done, and they're an inspiration. And needless to say, people should flock to see them in action. OK, there we go. That's Sean the Sheep Farmageddon. Now, moving on, the plight of Kurdish people is very much in the news this week after Turkey launched an offensive against Kurdish forces in northern Syria, which began after the US announced it was removing its troops from the area. The French journalist Caroline Forest set out to film a fact-based portrait of the all-female brigades fighting for the future of the Kurdish people. Tell us about Sisters in Arms. Well, the female brigades fighting for the survival and self-determination of Kurds have been the subject of several excellent documentaries in recent years. This fiction film follows an international brigade led very rigorously by a Kurdish woman and comprised of female volunteers from Italy, Israel, the US, England, and France. The central character, 19-year-old Zara, is easy to identify with because she's quite lovely and she radiates natural goodness. She's a Yezidi, one of the oldest tribes in Mesopotamia. Now, they have their own religious beliefs and never converted to Islam, and so they're considered to be devil worshippers by the uh, fanatical jihadists. One day, while the villagers are basking in the joys of nature in their close-knit families, Islamic fanatics arrive with machine guns, execute the men, take the young females to sell as sex slaves, and take young boys to indoctrinate them. The film is set in 2014 when the jihadists had control of many areas, and Zara mentions in passing that this is the 74th genocide perpetrated against the Kurds in history thus far. These women are brave and determined, and in addition to their strength and beauty, uh, they have a terrific bonus weapon, because jihadist fanatics believe that if they're killed by a woman, they'll be banned from paradise. Wow, it sounds powerful. Let's take a look. Who are those fighters? Special Forces Unit. It is a feminist revolution, right? Our revolution has no boundaries. For thousands of years, war has been waged on women's bodies. But here, for once, they fear us. Let me be killed by a man. There is no man here. Yes.
Now, Zara is sold to El Britanni, a blonde-eyed, blue-eyed British convert who conveniently believes that anything he happens to feel like doing aligns perfectly with God's will. He purchases Zara and rapes her repeatedly in the house he shares with his wife and brother-in-law. Zara escapes and after harrowing experiences joins the snake brigade of foreign fighters. So does this film work? Well, this is a tough one to assess. It's ambitious. It's about an absolutely vital topic. It is well-researched uh, as the first feature by an outspoken journalist and commentator. There are some very fine actors in the cast. The action scenes are really quite exciting, but it doesn't add up to a good film, and that's part of the mystery of filmmaking. Dedication and a sufficient budget in this case aren't enough to sock across this frequently clumsy story. There's too much repetitive emphasis on female solidarity, too much slow motion, too much clunky dialogue and an overbearing and annoying musical score, all of which undermine the multi-pronged tale of oppression and resistance. The director, however, does make her point that radical Islam is heavy on arbitrary cruelty posing as religious practice. So every day, a man with a megaphone drives through the streets announcing to people what they may and may not do. Of course, they can't eat a cucumber in public because that uh, resembles a male member. And my favorite, uh, it is forbidden to have sex with a corpse if it has been dead for over an hour. Okay, Lisa, we certainly learnt a lot, even if you didn't like the film. Well, Encore has actually made our own documentary that's airing this weekend on France 24. It's about the artists leading an indigenous renaissance in Canada. One of the people we speak to is 87-year-old Alanis Obam Salwin, who's made more than 50 films. She's one of the most acclaimed indigenous directors in the world. Her whole career has been an act of decolonialization. Her landmark documentary is Kana Sataki, 270 Years of Resistance. She spent 78 days filming the armed standoff between the Mohawks, who were fighting against their sacred ground, being turned into a golf course, and the police and the Canadian army. The pines are still when the police throw tear gas at the people standing there. Suddenly, the wind comes and the smoke turns towards the police and onto Highway 344. There was a war on, and uh, there was no facilities. Like, I was sleeping outside on the earth for weeks on end. But uh, I'm glad that I stayed. I saw so many people having so much courage and believing uh, in the reasons why they were doing the resistance, and they were right. Why do you think this film then became your most famous? It's historical, and it really became a turning point for all the nations in the country. Whenever there's a resistance or a, a fight with government, it always has to do with land and natural resources. In general, the people of this country, the Canadians, had no clue really of this kind of problem that all the nations had. They've all been robbed of their land, and some of them never got anything back. It's a shameful thing for the country. So I think people are taken more seriously now. And I don't think something like that will happen again. Listening to her, I'm proud that we take the time here at France 24 to uh, explore less known people and uh, worthwhile movies originating from all over the world. In addition to documenting the heritage of indigenous peoples on film, what's particularly interesting about her, I think, is like all true artists, she's still working at 87. Of course, having a government body that supports artists, in this case, the National Film Board of Canada, where she's been a consultant since 1967, is a big help, and a model that Canada's neighbor to the south could definitely learn from. Well, Lisa, she's actually just finished her 52nd film, Jordan River Anderson, The Messenger, and is working on another one. You can watch Canada's Indigenous Renaissance this weekend on France 24. Now, just before we go, the Lumiere Festival in Lyon makes a case for watching old treasures uh, from the past. It's on until the 20th of October. Tell us more. Well, the Festival Lumiere shows vintage movies on an almost unimaginable scale, with hundreds of film showings all over Lyon, including 4,000 people staying up all night to watch the Godfather trilogy together, because uh, director Francis Ford Coppola is the winner of this year's Prix Lumiere, following in the footsteps of Jane Fonda, Michael Cimino, Quentin Tarantino, Etc. Uh, this is the seventh edition of the unique accompanying market of publishers who specialize in reissuing old films on screen and on DVD, the world classic film market. Now, the term 
old movie is accurate, but it's also kind of derogatory. If you say you're going to the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa, do people say, oh, really? But that was painted like over 500 years ago. And if you say you're going to go see the musical Oliver, uh, does anyone say, oh, that old thing? It's from the 1960s. And Charles Dickens wrote the book in uh, 1837, Oliver Twist. But we do speak of old movies. But why would people pay to go and watch something in a movie theatre when they could probably download it for free or watch <laughs> it on DVD? Well, the answer to that question is surprising, especially here in France. Uh, France never really had a lot of video rental shops, and so movies were never cheapened by the idea that they're old and that therefore they should be remaindered like they get rid of old books and bookshops. Here's an amazing statistic. In France, four million people a year buy a ticket to see an old movie in a cinema, and that's up 30% over the last 20 years, so maybe the new movies aren't all that good. Uh, each year, a European country is highlighted in Lyon. This year, it's Germany, and the festival features a talk about restoring Coppola's Apocalypse Now final cut, which 40 years after the film premiered in Cannes, won the Palme d'Or, and has been on uh, French screens for almost two months. It is easily the best film you could possibly buy a ticket to right now, so it is not an old movie, it's a brilliant movie. Okay, well, we're going to leave you with that, Lisa. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember our website, we're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this.